The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hi, welcome to a discussion with Robert Crace. I'm Bruce Southworth, mystery book reviewer for Publishers Weekly and the Drood Review of Mysteries. Robert Crace is the author of the successful Elvis Cole mystery series, the most recent of which is Voodoo River, published June of 1995 by Hyperion. Others in the series include uh, Monkey's Raincoat, Stalking the Angel, Lullaby Town, and Freefall. In addition to being an author, uh, he's been a television scriptwriter, working on such series as Hill Street Blues, Beretta, uh, Miami Vice, Cagney and Lacey, um, I'm probably forgetting a couple. He's also worked on uh, a highly acclaimed miniseries called Cross of Fire, which details the development of the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s, I believe it was. Yep. And in addition to his, uh, his scholarly pursuits, he's uh, a pilot, a gourmet cook, long distance runner, and he has the enviable distinction of living among 14,000 books in the <laughs> collection. So welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Bruce, it's fun to be here. Thanks. Um, you said at one point that all of your books deal uh, in some way or another with an aspect of your life. Voodoo River deals with a young woman who has just recently discovered that she has been adopted and she's looking for some information not so much to find her birth parents but for some medical information and so on and I understand that, that you were adopted as well. Was that sort of the the genesis for this particular story? Absol yeah, absolutely, yes it was. Um, I, I, I'm adopted uh, it was never an issue for mm -hmm. me, no big deal at all. Uh, I never had any um, uh, desire for a reunion with my birth mother, mm -hmm. uh, never fantasized about it. I mean, my mom and dad were my mom and dad. End of story. A um, couple of years ago, though, I went in uh, to see my doctor for a triannual physical, just your basic physical, mm -hmm. and he discovered something mm -hmm. that uh, uh, might well have developed into a health problem, and it became imperative, I think, at the time for myself and, and for my wife, too, for me to, to try to find out what was up the, uh, the bloodline family tree. And that got me to thinking quite a bit about um, uh, that particular search, mm -hmm. uh, because those documents are all sealed. Um, uh, you often have to hire a private detective to, uh, to, to uncover these things or various agencies. And, and it was, it was an, the conflicted feelings that I had about uh, that entire issue that I think led me to create Voodoo River. One of the interesting sensations that I had when um, Elvis Cole is talking to Jody Taylor when she's arrived, now a lot of the action, most of the action takes place in Louisiana, right. outside of New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and so on, that um, as she's about to meet her birth mother, she's, she's there's a, there's a conversation that goes on between them, and it almost seems like, in a sense, she's an alter ego. Uh, that's kind of the way I thought about it. It's kind of like the discussion, do I want to, do I not want to? And I was wondering if Absolutely. that was that tension that was coming out there. Absolutely. I, uh, it's it's kind of interesting to me. I, I found that I created two characters in the book, two, each of whom to mirror um, a certain side of my feelings on mm -hmm. on on the issue of a possible reunion with my birth mother. I created Jody Taylor, who's, um, um, I guess, the, the, the genesis of the story. As you said, she comes to Elvis and she hires him ostensibly to find her, her uh, birth parents. Mm -hmm. And though she starts off saying, I, I have no wish for a reunion, the more she learns about her, her birth mother, um, the more she wants to know uh, until she finally reaches a point where she wants to have a reunion with this person. And I also created Lucy Chenier, uh, mm -hmm. an attorney in, in Baton Rouge who, who works in adoption issues and who is herself adopted. But she doesn't have any interest in, um, uh, in a reunion and learning anything about her birth parents at all. And, and I think these two women were sort of the, uh, the, the Greek chorus for me, as it were, uh, as, I, as, I, as I worked my way through the book using Elvis Cole as a guide. To, to sort out how I felt about these things. Because when I was, when I was pursuing my own search, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what I wanted. I wasn't sure if I was comfortable with the thought of a reunion. I didn't know if a reunion would be uh, necessary or even possible. Mm -hmm. How would, uh, if, if I had to meet my birth mother, how would I relate to her? 
what would I call her? How would she relate to me? Um, that particular scene you referenced where Jody Taylor finally does meet her birth mother, I think, was probably the most intimate and personal scene I've ever written. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult to write. It took me a very long time to write, and I wrote it many, many, many times to try to get it uh, correct. And, I've, and there were days, I'll tell you, there were days when I was sitting at the word processor, uh, I mean, tears were streaming down um, my face trying to mine that ore deep down to, to get that scene just as honest as, as, as I could. There's, um, I don't know, it's a strange sensation when you're reading dialogue to hear essentially what, what in my mind was a sort of a quiver in a character's voice. You know, just that sort of emotion uh, coming out. And that's, that's the sense that I had in that particular, in that particular scene. So, I, I mean, it, it came across very, very, very honestly, I think. Thanks. So. Thanks. Was it, is it an interesting experience trying to investigate yourself, though? Uh, it was interesting. I'll tell you, it was also fun, too, um, uh, because there was a, a, a real-world stuff. You know, there are certain things that an adoptee can do mm -hmm. to, 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 to learn your past history. And I did those things, and they, and they weren't particularly informative. You can go back to the state. The state is allowed legally to release to you what's called non-identifying information. Mm -hmm. That's just uh, uh, reports that were taken by social workers at the time, and, and, and they give you whatever information there that doesn't identify the birth parent. Um, past that, they can't do anything. And, and at that point, you become, um, you either hire a detective or you become a detective, and before I sought professional help, mm -hmm. um, I decided to play detective and see what I could I could find. I, I knew the town of my birth. I knew when I was born. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this. Sorry to interrupt. This is also Louisiana. This takes place. This in is the same, Louisiana. I was born. I was born in Louisiana, raised in Louisiana, and that's why this story, Voodoo River, takes place in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, I felt it abs I absolutely had to go back home to tell this story. You know, it's, it's, it's fiction, so I could have created Jody Taylor, the, the adoptee, and I could have had her from anywhere. I could have said it in, 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 in Minnesota. I could have said it in Canada. She could have been from any place. Mm -hmm. But this is my story, so I really wanted to go home where, where I grew up and uh, bring Elvis there for the first time and, and, and really deal with the place and, and the whole rhythm of Louisiana and Cajun country. Um, so that's what I did. And as, as part of the research, it was funny, for a couple of weeks I went back and I got to play Elvis Cole. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I guess, I guess it was goofy, but you know, I, I was sincere and, it, and I think it had dividends in the books. I, I, I went back, I knew where I was born, I knew, uh, I went back to the little town. Um, I went to the library there just as Elvis does in, mm -hmm. in, in the book. Um, I, I, I spoke with people, uh, you know, my, my version of undercover, because I didn't, I didn't tell them uh, who and what I was, I was doing um, for fear that if you, you know, if, 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 if you go back and you're saying, here I am, I'm this adopted kid, I'm trying to find uh, my, my birth mother, <coughs> people might have a tendency to view you as a nut. Mm -hmm. um, or, or God knows what could go on. Also, in, in the small town environment, the uh, um, I don't think the police are particularly uh, uh, friendly towards strangers uh, uh, coming in and snooping around. But I went to the libraries. I dug up uh, old phone books from uh, from the time. I went to every area high school, looking for um, uh, looking through um, um, high school and junior high school um, class class yearbooks. Mm -hmm checking names, checking um, uh, photographs. <clears throat> what it really taught me is that I needed professional help. <laughs> but but it, was, it, was, uh, it was fun and interesting, and I think I applied all those things to the, to the book. I, th I think it would, be, it would be fascinating. Now, um, throughout all of your books, you've, you've, you've had some really kind of offbeat characters. Um, one that I remember, although I can't remember his name, unfortunately, is sort of a thug, for lack of a better word, who uh, I remember he and Elvis driving around the streets of, I think it was New York at some time, listening to cassettes, and they were talking about music and whatnot, but at the same time, he could turn very easily and just 
punch somebody out or shoot them or whatever. In this book, I mean, he, he's sort of an odd character in that mm -hmm. he's likable, but he's despicable. <laughs> and in this book, um, one of the odd characters is this, this elderly woman that Elvis sees who's constantly spraying raid all over the place. And uh, are, the, are these the kinds of people that you run into in life and in this kind of an investigation? Sure. Mar in fact, you're talking about Martha Guidry, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the raid... Uh, the raid sprayer. Mm -hmm. Martha is actually uh, uh, based on one of my one of my dear relatives. Ah, yeah. Um, <laughs> does she know who she is? Yes, she does. Oh, yeah. We had a we had a great we had a great laugh about it. And uh, uh, but I grew up with people like that. Interesting. It was an odd place to uh, it was an odd place to grow up. Well, now you did something odd also once you <laughs> there. You you've done many odd things. Well, a, a, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't have time to cover all of them, so we may have to go into three parts here. But uh, you up and joined the carnival, I understand, when you were young. And what, what kinds of things, well, what motivated you to do that, I guess? I'm I fell in love with it. When, where, I, where I grew up, um, we had um, uh, something called Bill Haynes Century 21 Shows in Midway. It was a touring Midway that worked East Texas, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and mm -hmm. Western Florida. Uh, Bill Haynes was a real low-class dive of a crummy midway. Everything was greasy and rusted, and there was a coot show, and there was one of those great, you know, uh, metal globes that the guy in the motorcycle got in and rode around upside uh, down and mm -hmm. all of these things. There was a freak show. There was a, a long midway of uh, concessions, you know, ball toss games and, and, um, and, and all these different, different things. So I, it came to town, and it set up at the local airfield, and, and, I, and I went to it, rode my bike, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I thought, this is great. You know, this is just the most wonderful place in the universe. I, I, I had no taste even then. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't this be, be, be cool to, to just hang around here? Mm -hmm. And I got to talking with, with what, what these places would do is they hit a town, and then they look to the, the people who own the different concessions and whatnot look for local hires to, mm -hmm. um, uh, because they can't afford to carry, to carry people. Right. Um, and I met a woman. She was a, a retired acrobat. Her, her family had been literally in the circus for, for you know, over a hundred years. She was multi-generation. <clears throat> she had a ball toss concession, mm -hmm. and she, she offered me a job working there, setting up the cats, you know, okay. picking up baseballs. Um, and I said, this would be great. And, and I started working for her, and they were getting ready to hit the road. And I said, you know, Jesus, I, I don't want to quit. I want to I keep doing this. Um, so I went home and I said, can I keep doing this? And they said, sure, why not? <laughs> um, and I stayed with them for, um, for a while until, until my, uh, my carnival life came crashing down around my ears. Okay, well, this, this, this brings me to... I, I knew where it would bring you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so we have to ask. Um, in, in the information I've, I've been able to gather up, there's, the, there's a story about the human cannonball, the human cannonball bringing your career to an end. So what's that all about? It's a true story. The, uh, we had a human cannonball. And every evening he would uh, put, his, put up his cannon at the end of the midway, mm -hmm. and he had the net 60 feet away. And he would climb up on the muzzle of the cannon, make a big spiel about how much pa uh, black powder he would pack into it and how dangerous the, the, the act was and all of this stuff. And, and people would gather around, and he'd, he'd do the deal. So I was fascinated. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty neat, you know, this whole evil Knievel kind of thing working. And uh, one day... When, when it was down and I was just hanging around the midway before, before the people started coming, I went back through the tents and I inspected the cannon and I found out how it's really done. Now, Bruce, I'm going to tell you this as a secret. You, you must like never tell anyone. Okay, we'll have to shoot all of us here. Okay. Exactly right. Everyone here must die. Um, well, of course, it's, it's just a big spring. It's a spring-loaded catapult uh -huh. and, the, and there's no powder in there. It's just a gas charge to make it look like there's, there's smoke. Well. I was naive and stupid even then, and I, and I just felt such a sense of outrage. You know, this man is lying. You know, I thought, oh my God, what a surprise. This man is lying to these people every night. I was so, I was so filled with, with moral outrage mm -hmm. that the very next night when he was making his spiel and standing on the muzzle of the cannon, and I'm gonna risk my life, and there's thousands of pounds of black powder, and we could all die, it could explode, I, I stood up on, on one of the end trucks mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the midway over, you know, so I was above the crowd too. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs, fake, fake, done with a spring. <clears throat> and people started looking at me 
and they're looking at him and they're looking at me and I'm yelling, he's lying to you all. I felt you know, like Kevin McCarthy, an invasion of the body snatchers. I'm, you know, I'm trying to tell. <clears throat> so the guy looks down and he, and he sees me and he, and he recognized me and his face just flushed red. So he, he finally he finished, he finished his act. I got tired of my thing and I jumped down and he, and he finished his act. He comes swinging down out of this, out of this net mm -hmm. and the crowd's breaking up and, and, and I'm beating it back through the crowds between the midway. And the next thing I know from between, from between two of the, uh, the concessions, I mean, this, this claw, like Rodan the monster, reaches out, grabs me, yanks me back. 14 years old, it was the scariest thing I ever saw. Here comes you know, the, the, the longest knife that has ever been made. And he said, kid, if I ever see you around here again, I'll cut your head off. And that was all I needed. I, I was stupid, but at that moment, I got real smart real fast. And that ended my, my employment with Bill Haynes Century 21 shows in Midway. I went home. You went home. <laughs> yeah. And thus began a new chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and the, these are the origins of a writer, what can I tell you? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's plumbing the depths. Now, you went, how, did, how did you go from that to writing TV scripts? I mean, that seemed um, like a, a kind of almost immediate transition. You know what? I, you, you, but, but you know what? I, I think it's, it's indicative of um, I've always been drawn to fantasy. Mm -hmm. The carnival is fantasy. Um, you know, my love of movies, my love of books. I've always been a, a, a reader. Um, anything, you know, magazines, comic books, novels, nonfiction. You know, if, if it would take me to another place, mm -hmm. I, I loved it. Um, somewhere in there, I, I started telling stories. You know, I started writing little stories and, and making my own books. Uh, I was drawn to it the way a firefly is drawn, or a moth is drawn to a to a to a candle. And um, by the time I got to college, I guess I was proficient enough at it to, as I wrote short stories and submitted some of these things sold. Hmm. And this made me think, my God, you dummy, you can actually you know, make some money doing this. Maybe there's even a chance you can you can make a living at it. I was a big fan of television mm -hmm. at, at that time. And I thought my, the choice for me was should I go to New York and be a serious literary short story writer or should I go to Hollywood and make a lot of money and have fun? <laughs> um, so I went to Hollywood. And I was unsurprised. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned a lot of lessons from the uh, Human Cannonball. Um, and I, it, 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 that's I think is the natural <coughs> progression. That's how I think it ties in. Uh, I wanted to be a part of the creation of fantasy worlds. Mm -hmm. And I went out to Hollywood to write TV. Now I understand that you um, learned script writing in an interesting way, or at least one aspect of, of your learning of that craft was interesting. That you would go to, I know there's there's little back alley garages that sell scripts and photos and all that when sort of thing. When I went to Los Hollywood. Angeles, I didn't, I, I knew no one. There wasn't, there were no contacts, none of this. No one, no, you know, no Uncle Mari, head of the studio, wasn't any of that. I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen a script, didn't know what a script looked like. Um, I went to a bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard that sold secondhand scripts for, I believe it was $2.50 a pop. I mm -hmm. uh, bought a couple, went home, you know, pulled them apart, stuck the pages in, in my typewriter, measured all the margins, saw where everything lined up, uh, studied the scripts, uh, studied television, uh, studied my favorite shows, really broke it down trying to teach myself, yeah, teaching myself how to write an hour script. Um, and that's what I did. I started writing some, and it, it happened real quickly for me. The, very, the second script I wrote uh, sold, and, and, and I became a TV writer. I'm curious about the, um, some, the, the series that, uh, that we mentioned at the outset, Hill Street Blues, L.A. Law, and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've, they've got ongoing multi-layers going on all at the same time. When you submit a script or submitted a script to those types of shows, were you able to kind of tell something that you wanted to tell or did you have to really just fit into the flow of what they were doing and, and kind of buy into their program as it were? Well you 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 have to uh, clearly you have to service the series mm -hmm. uh, you have to fit into what they want. W when I worked on Hill Street I was in addition to writing episodes for it I was I was also on staff there I was a, a story editor mm -hmm. um, and all of those shows were gang written you know there would be four five six of us in a room and it was very collaborative. We would all work out the stories. We would all pitch out ideas. Um, 
once we had all the storylines, A, B, C, D, whatever it was, worked mm -hmm. out, and we would sit there on a chalkboard. We'd write them all out each step. When, when those were, were worked out, we would divide it up. You know, you take Act 1, you take Act 2, hmm. you take this, you take that. <clears throat> it was fun, yeah, and, it, and, and I think um, I did nice work during those days. But um, it, it, it's, it's not your work. It, it's not uh, intensely personal. It's it's all it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. I think that, in fact, that that sense, that feeling on my part, is ultimately what led me back to prose and, and finally into writing the Elvis Cole novels, because I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to write the themes and explore the themes that that I wanted to explore, and I wanted to write about the world as as I saw it in in my way. Um, so TV was, 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 was great fun, but definitely it's collaborative. Um, I have kind of two questions floating at the same time here. That I, one is, uh, uh, did that kind of um, structure and means of putting together a story affect the way you create a novel in the sense, I mean, are you very structured yes. when you work the novel? Yeah, you absolutely. everything out? Absolutely. Um, I, first, I think, I think working in television uh, when and where I did mm -hmm. helped my my novel writing immensely. Uh, helped my dialogue, helped my pace, mm -hmm. helped my structure. It also taught me some 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 things. Um, and to this day, when I write novels, as in TV, you have to outline everything. You have to, you know, as we were, as I was describing about Hill Street, you come up with all the steps, all the scenes, everything in advance. Mm -hmm. That's the way I write books. I, I outline extensively. I know everything that's going to happen in the book before I write the book. Um, it, clearly, there's some flexibility. Sometimes things change, but, mm -hmm. but I outline extensively. So I think that directly came from my involvement in television. The other thing that, that um, I'm wondering if kind of ran through this as a sort of a, a thread was, um, how to put this, Elvis Cole um, seems to be one of his main motivations seems to be that he becomes fairly indignant and acts in a variety of ways to, to clear that up when uh, powerful people sort of abuse that power and, and put other people who aren't as powerful under their thumb, who mm -hmm. just take advantage of them or oppress them or whatever. Um, in a way, that sounds like your, your human cannonball. You know, he was just taking advantage it's of moral outrage again, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Did that was that something also that kind of flowed through those? I mean, all of those types of shows really seem to deal with moral outrage in a lot of cases. I mean, they they dealt with trying to uh, make things right and and carry things through. Yeah, I, I I think so. I mean, certainly that's that's an interest of mine. I think that's sort of inherent though in in crime fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, crime fiction tends to be about right and wrong. Good and bad. Mm -hmm. you know, there are there are good guys and there are bad guys, and and some sort of judgment seems in order. Um, clearly, in in the Elvis Cole novels, that's that's definitely one of the patterns that I've that I've created for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Elvis Elvis is a is a good man, uh, a man of 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 virtue and ethic, and uh, I think he takes great offense. When uh, when others violate his sense of uh, uh, his sense of morality, yeah, I um, I remember reading a comment that you made that that Elvis is the person that you would like to be. Yes, um, and I, I can see a great kinship. And I'm curious, um, where is is Joe Pike then? Perhaps um, an element of your darker side, or where did he come from? Yeah, Joe is my darker side. When I when I was when I was. Um, Working, you know, these, <laughs> these books are sort of self-help. You know, these are self-therapy books. Um, Elvis and Joe, I think of as yin and yang. I mm -hmm. think of Elvis as as my lighter side. He's the optimistic part of me. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the part that's trying to make the world a better place. <clears throat> and then there's Joe. Joe is more complex, I think, than many people realize because he's so internalized. But Joe uh, is. Um, Joe, I think, is, is, is the wounded part. You know, there's a reason that Joe is the way he is. There must be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he's simply a cartoon. Um, I think that somewhere in the past, Joe was greatly wounded, greatly hurt. And the only way he could take care of himself was to shut it all down, just the way he has. 
Uh, he's, he, he's walled off from the outside world. Uh, he's, he's now in almost what I would describe a, a, a pure survival mode, which is why he's so intensely focused mm -hmm. on whatever the task is. So that's also what makes him so very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and Joe then I see is, is, is the dark side of, 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 of Elvis. It's interesting because he also seems to have uh, a sense of humor. I mean, that, that Clearly, comes through in a, yes. in a way, uh, yes. which in a way you wouldn't think of as a person who's completely shut off the right. world. You know, having a sense of humor is very important, I guess, for survival. But also um, the loyalty and the friendship that exists between Joe Pike and Elvis is, yeah. is very, very intriguing. And it's, it's fun to, uh, in Voodoo River, when they're taking a very long run together, it's, it's real interesting just kind of eavesdropping on the discussion that goes on between the two because you realize how close they are. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, everybody should read the book just to, you know, <laughs> to find out about all of those things. But, um, you know, I often, I often think that, that Elvis Cole is really uh, Joe's only connection with the rest of the human race. Um, uh, you, you know, Joe has another life. There, he owns a gun shop. People work for him. He dates Ellen Lang. But uh, it seems to me that, that in some way he needs Elvis Cole to anchor himself to, to, to reality. It's also interesting how he sort of comes in like the 7th Cavalry, you know, pretty much. I mean, things get completely blown out, yes. of, out of hand, and then he's having to come in and not really rescue, but um, it's sort of when, to use the term again, the moral indignation reaches a boiling point, you know, and Elvis just can't we're going to have to do something about yeah. this, whatever the situation is. You know, I, I do that, uh, that recurs in the books, and I do that mm -hmm. on purpose. Um, uh, because I think one of Joe's, one of, one of Joe's purposes in, in, uh, in this little reality that I'm creating with these books, <clears throat> it's very important for Joe to take care of Elvis. You know, as I was saying before, it's like Elvis is his anchor. Mm -hmm. And I think Joe is very protective of Elvis. So there's a sense that I have that no matter what Elvis is, is up to, somewhere out there in the shadows, Joe's going to be there. And Elvis knows that deep down, but mm -hmm. Joe is going to be there. So when the opportunity occurs, almost in this deus ex machina way, yeah, Joe Pike is going to be there to, to, to help his friend out. I think that's great. Unfortunately, we've, we've essentially run out of time ourselves, and I want to thank you very much. The, the new book in the series is Voodoo River by Hyperion. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Bruce, thank you. It's my pleasure. Take care. presentation of the Hennepin County Library.